Hey, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. And today I got a quick little reaction video about this Vice News video about freight railroad safety in this country. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, we'll talk as the video goes along. Graphics are better than mine. It's been almost eight years since a train carrying two million gallons of liquid petroleum crashed in a town in Quebec. Forty buildings were destroyed, millions of gallons of oil spilled into a nearby river, and 47 people died. The causes, according to the country's Transportation Safety Board, cost-cutting them. And, uh, of course, I'm not going to get too much into this uh, in derailment in this video. It's worth its own video in the future, of course. Uh, but this railroad involved was the Montreal, Maine, Atlantic, a shoreline railroad that uh, went into Canada and... Maine, obviously, as the name implies, but uh, the reason why it all started was a the diesel engine had a, a bad oil leak and it was sputtering oil at the top and it actually caught on fire. So yeah, cost cutting was definitely part of this, the uh, contributing factors as long as well as many other many other factors, uh, including rail oversight and all kinds of things. But like I said, I'm not going to get too far into it today. The same cost cutting measures that are now being seen across the U.S. freight network, which makes it especially troubling that freight trains in the U.S. are crashing. A lot. In 2019, 341 freight train derailments were reported. And this year, local news reports across the country are showing that it's a trend. One that's only getting worse. UP had a bad one just a couple weeks ago here in Nebraska. <laughs> And you don't have to dig too deep into freight train YouTube, which, yes, is a thing, to learn that people in the industry are worried where this trend is leading. It's only a matter of time before fatigued work. Um, not going to critique this guy too much. I don't know anything about him. This is the first time I've heard of him. And I'm not going to critique unions. I'm just saying this uh, the same way that whenever you hear a somebody from the Association of American Railroads or a freight railroad company themselves talk, you have to take it with a huge grain of salt because they're obviously coming from their own uh, perspective, trying to look out for their own interests. Whenever you hear somebody from a union talk, you have to take it with a bit of a grain of salt because obviously they're looking out for their members' interest and uh, looking to try and not concede anything uh, too much, but yeah, it's gone. Unrealistic inspection policies and unqualified inspections result in a major incident in someone's neighborhood. And he's definitely not wrong. 2017, a train operated by the company CSX derailed in Hinman, Pennsylvania. It crashed into one house, damaged two others, and because about half of the derailed cars were carrying hazardous material, the whole town had to evacuate. What led up to the derailment in Hinman was uh, it involved two crews. The first crew stopped because they had air brake issues. The conductor walked back. It was 178 rail cars. Uh, and uh, the conductor found a problem on the 158th car, which is usually how it goes. You always have to walk <laughs> at the very end when something goes wrong like that. Anyway, a carman came out, fixed the problem, and... Uh, they handed it off to another crew because they were dead and they ran out of time. The second crew, they, the first crew tied 58 handbrakes because they were on a pretty steep grade. The second crew came out and uh, tried to pull, didn't realize they had 58 handbrakes on it. Obviously, they weren't going anywhere. So the conductor only released uh, 25 handbrakes. Then there were remaining 33 handbrakes left, many of them on empty cars. And what happened was those Empty cars, when they have a handbrake tied on them, unless it's not tied very tightly, they will just skate right on top of the track and develop huge flat spots. So that's obviously what happened. One of the empty cars was a high-sided gondola car derailed, and uh, they were dragging it for like a mile and a half until it hit a highway crossing that popped up and derailed the rest of the train in Hinman. Uh, it was a horrible... <laughs> He's so easily preventable uh, derailment. They never should have had that many empty cars on the head end of the train. Uh, as far as train makeup and instructions go on my railroad, 
you can have empty cars towards the head of the train. You just can't have them in the first 10 cars. But uh, either way, you can't use empty cars, handbrakes on empty cars to control slack, control speed down a hill. That was one of the NTSB findings. And it's just like, yeah, obviously that's, <laughs> uh, should be pretty obvious. You should never drag an empty car anywhere with a handbrake on it, but uh, is what it is. Let's go on. In an official report, the National Transportation Safety Board found that the derailment happened because of bad braking procedure and putting empty that would be the empty handbrake cars in the wrong spot. Two of the oldest and most basic protocols in rail operation. Uh, automatic handbrakes or automatic air brakes have uh, only been around since the turn of the last century. Uh, railroads fought that the way that they fought PTC implementation. And uh, yeah, they're pretty important. <laughs> Many rail workers and experts think that what happened in Tenmin is similar to what's happening across the industry. And keep in mind, they're going to talk about uh, precision scheduled railroad in just a moment. CSX was the first American railroad after the two Canadian ones to adopt it. And it led them to do all kinds of ridiculous things like uh, ripping up hump yards. They closed several hump yards across the system. Uh, they were talking about ripping up track on the water level route. The uh, railway age did a big spread hearing for using anecdotes from managers across the system and employees across the system. Uh, one yard, smaller, smaller yard, it sounded like they got rid of the bus. So the train master was using his personal vehicle to take train, uh, crews to train. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, it's yeah, insane. But yeah, when he talks about precision scheduled railroading, basically just think of it as railroads kind of half ass attempt to turn their networks into something like FedEx, how they uh, handle packages where all the packages come into a centralized terminal and then are diverted out. And they're doing this by closing hump yards across their system to, uh, and building longer trains to move those cars across the system faster. And, uh, and my railroad's doing it. We're having longer mixed freight trains, uh, like nine, 10,000 footers, which obviously it can work, but they're having a lot of problems getting it to work, you know, uh, with having knuckles and trains coming apart and uh, yeah, CSX's case, derailments. It's hard to generalize uh, freight rail issues based on derailments and incidents like this because usually horrible incidents like this have such a detailed string of things that have to happen for them to work out exactly as they had. But you can make generalizations and basically ask yes, cost cutting measures fueled by the implementation of PSR is causing serious problems in this country. Last year we had, uh, they got rid of utility employees in the yard and yes, you, you, you men do have, utility employees do have times where they're just sitting around waiting on jobs, but uh, it led to conductors doing more of their own set outs. Like when they find bad ordered cars, the Carmen find bad ordered cars, you have to set them out of your train in the yard. And what had happened was we get a lot of crews from Creston, Kansas City, McCook that aren't very familiar with the yard. And we had like three derailments right off the bat in the yards. Nothing major, but... Yeah, they, uh, they were definitely paying for it. <laughs> Obviously, it probably, on paper, they still probably came out ahead, but, you know, is derailing cars, potentially hazardous cars worth it? I don't think so. Rules and practices that are supposed to make a rail network safe are being ignored. And they think it's happening for one simple reason, profits. All the, the root of basically everything. A business philosophy based on something called precision scheduled railroad or PSR. Advocates of PSR say it's a way to use technology to improve efficiency. But most people who work on the trains and tracks every day will tell you the PSR is just a way of cutting costs. So technology, some of the big things that are, he, he'll touch on later, but uh, that they're talking about are uh, in com increased computer, I, I don't know if they're using AI or not, but increased scheduling to try and better you know, build trains so that they're easier to switch out at the fewer hump yards so that they can be switched out quicker. 
Uh, I know UP has been kind of leading the way with automation uh, as far as train inspections. They call it machine vision. They've set up uh, a few sites across their network where they have like a million cameras and lasers and all kinds of crap that uh, take a very detailed picture of each individual car and creates, you know, of course, huge amounts of data. But obviously this is the first step towards reducing... Uh, train inspections uh, to ultimately work to reduce carmen on the system and they've already it's been a few years now but they've already gotten the fra to sign off on raising it used to be extended haul air test could only go for 1500 miles so every 1500 miles the train would have to have another extended haul air test they bumped that up to 1800 miles and uh, when he talks about freight car inspections that's nothing that we as operating crews deal with. Uh, that's a Carmen thing, so I'm not I'm going to have to take his word for it. I assume their facts are probably correct, but uh, I just, we don't do safety, the, those types of safety inspections because they don't fix the cars. So. Which likely means more money for executives and shareholders. Because unlike our roads, bridges, tunnels, and public transit, the entire freight system in the U.S. is privately owned, meaning at least in the eyes of management, Every dollar spent on maintenance and good safety practices is a dollar coming out of their pockets. Not surprisingly, companies are choosing profits. And workers across the industry told me it's pretty obvious. In the push for efficiency, fewer workers are being tasked with more, they're rushed through train inspections and repairs, and they're pressured not to report safety issues that would take time and manpower to fix. I will say, as a road operating crew, most of the air tests that are performed either by the conductor that I'm working with or by myself if I'm ever set back are uh, at grain elevators or, you know, on a local train. But usually it's just grain trains around here. And uh, there isn't so much pressure. I, there is pressure some in some certain circumstances where the train is very hot and they want to get it out the door. But... Uh, I was actually, when I was a pretty new employee, I had less than a year out, and I had a Federal uh, federal Railroad Administration mechanical inspector come with us up to an elevator here in Nebraska, and he was with us. It took us like four hours to air test the train, <laughs> which, you know, we're walking, and he was just looking at everything. We battled with like seven cars, and they, they sent a train master up to try and uh find out what the heck was going on with us and yeah there was definitely pressure they brought a carmen up fixed a couple of the things so we didn't have to set out every all seven of those cars but yeah there is there is pressure by management sometimes other times you know you could air test a train and wait to get out and sit there all 12 hours and just die and never leave the facility but there is a general culture and uh i'm not going to name names or anything like that or point the finger too much but there is a general culture across the freight railroads to not bad order cars specifically because the individual crews don't want to do the extra work of setting them out um and that it just is what it is it uh i would imagine it's a problem across all freight railroads it it's not the management cracking, telling them that they can't set out the cars. It's just kind of laziness. So that's just one aspect of it. Federal regulations say train cars aren't supposed to go go more than 3,500 miles without a safety inspection. This but is what I was talking about. I, I don't know the these rules specifically. For 10 times that distance. One worker said he recently saw cars that hadn't been inspected for 90,000 miles. And when inspections do happen, there's less time to do that. I will also say, too, about one of the railroads they're talking about here is we recently uh, started running trains to a power plant that we'd never serviced before, at least not for like 17 years. And uh, the trains that <laughs> we got that were owned by this utility, they were horrible. Um, after the first like week, we had bad ordered cars from these trains all over the place, like I think just in my terminal, there was probably like 10 to 15 cars that were, uh, so it just shows you that, yeah, the other railroad was not maintaining the cars, like, at all. <laughs> and it might have just been leading up to uh, handing the trains off to my railroad to send the cost to us, but 
either way it is completely ridiculous so yeah there shows you that there's something wrong uh there's something wrong with safety inspections on cars for sure it used to take about three minutes to inspect a car but about five years ago norfolk southern one of the biggest freight companies in the u.s said inspections need to be done in two and a half minutes or less many workers told me that was pretty reasonable but in the past two years, management dropped that to two minutes per car, then 1.8, then 1.5. And keep in mind when he's talking about these numbers, they're not standing out there with a stopwatch, uh, you know, telling people that they have to move on to the next car. It, it would, I'm sure that they're talking about the average time for an air test for the entire train. So if you have a 100 car train, then they want it done in, you know, 150 minutes or whatever. Now it's 1.4. That's one minute, 24 seconds to look at dozens of inspection points on a car that can be up to 100 feet in length. The consequences of these policies can be pretty dire. In 2018, two Union Pacific trains collided in Wyoming. This uh, collision was caused by also, again, a number of factors. Uh, but the main ones were there was a blockage in the first few cars that he mentions that they picked up. And second of all, I'm not 100% sure of the train's total length. All right, so that train had three locomotives and 95 loaded rail cars and 10 empty rail cars. So 105 is 12,400 tons, 6,581 feet long. So it's not a huge train, but obviously uh, Sherman Hill is pretty steep grade. But anyway, yeah, so there was a blockage in the first few cars, and even though it was only a 6,500 foot train, um, the f flashing rear end device, or FRED, or end of train device, uh, was had lost comm with the head end. So, And they talk about it also in their findings that when the engineer applied the emergency brakes from the head end, it automatically sends a signal to the rear end of the train to dump the air from the rear. But because it had lost comm, that never got that signal. And apparently the locomotives keep sending out the signal to place the train into emergency for two minutes. And then it times out and it stops. So it could have theoretically gotten calm again. Obviously it wouldn't have once the train struck the stationary train. But a uh, that's not good. So that was one of the NTSB's finding is to you know fix that. One was unable to stop and was speeding down a hill at 50 miles per hour. An NTSB investigation found that six cars added at the previous stop were overdue for air brake testing. Some by just a few weeks, others by almost 24 months. And they, they document it very well in the NTSB investigation. Um, because of the hilly nature of where the train was operating, they kept transitioning from power to dynamic brakes. And um, usually... You, when you bunch up the train and go into dynamic braking, it uh, the, the the cars coming closer together will open up the uh, air hoses just a little bit and it'll leak out a little bit of air. But when it, it said when it came together that the flow actually dropped. So it's the opposite of the, what usually happens. So that indicates that there was likely uh, probably a brake hose. It could have been uh, like a long brake hose or something like that, but was getting kinked. When the cars came together and of course they were in dynamic brakes when they were going down the hill so it's yeah it's a very very unfortunate situation very specific set of circumstances that led to it but nevertheless uh like i said it's hard to draw conclusions from individual accidents like this that are so dissimilar from other ones but when you take them all together you can see that yes lack of investment uh created by you know trying to maximize profits up over the last several years has spent hundreds of millions of dollars in stock buybacks they've been criticized by that and uh yeah it's ridiculous you know i think it was probably four or five years ago but they spent like 300 million dollars and then they included it as their capital improvement as if somehow spending 300 million dollars on stock buybacks did anything for their network it does the opposite obviously but that's for another video two crewmen ultimately died. They were on a striking train. Pacific told us their equipment is properly inspected, their inspections meet federal regulations, and PSR-like initiatives have actually improved safety. 
Norfolk Southern and CSX told us similar things, that their inspections meet federal regulation and that they've improved safety performance over recent years. But in the last few years, the number of derailments is increasing. It's especially troubling since trains are the only way to move hazardous materials like molten asphalt and sodium chlorine. And crude oil and ammonia, and chlorine and ethanol and all kinds of horrible chemicals. And you only have to look at the 2013 crash in Quebec to see how catastrophic this can be. A union president compared what's currently happening in the industry to what happened with Boeing when the combination of prioritizing profits over safety with federal regulators asleep at the wheel led to the preventable crashes that killed 346 people. All right, uh, just to be pedantic and uh, to try to present a fair picture here, it is somewhat debatable how closely the Boeing situation resembles freight railroads in this circumstance. However, I will say, yes, broadly speaking, Lack of investment by railroads in simple things like track maintenance, rail car maintenance, uh, crew. So they, they, when they furlough, they usually furlough too many crew so that we're working on our rest instead of working at a more normal pace with a few more employees uh, possibly working not on our rest. So obviously it will cost the railroad a little bit more, but at the end of the day, You'll likely have more crews that are rested and not falling asleep in the middle of the night. But uh, yes, broadly speaking, underinvestment in American railroads is leading to decreased safety. There's no debating that. End of story. So uh, yes, I, I will agree with that. Railroad workers tell me they're speaking out in the hopes of getting people in power. To and keep in mind, uh, regardless of what your personal feelings about unions are, all class one railroads in this country are closed union shops because it's uh, allowed under the Federal Railway Labor Act. And uh, yeah, they're the only ones, <laughs> they're the only voice that there even is to speak out against freight railroads because certainly they're not going to. The NTSB and the FRA are neutral government bodies, so they can't speak out against the FRA. So who's left? Then we got environmentalists and... Uh, Union employees, so, you know, I'm sorry if that rubs you the wrong way, but it just kind of is what it is. Now, not after a tragedy makes it impossible to ignore. And unfortunately, just to wrap up, uh, yeah, derailments are way of life on American railroading because railroads have decided that it is cheaper to have derailments and pay for the, the cost of cleanup and damages rather than be proactive with safety and uh, basically do what they need to be doing to prevent derailments. So yes, even though we have positive train control on most of the American, most of the American rail network that ships the most amount of freight, uh, derailments, collisions, they're going to keep happening. There's just no two ways about it. Hopefully they're not too bad. Hopefully there's not too many horrible toxic chemicals involved, but uh, yeah, just don't be surprised when it happens. Anyway, Thank you so much for watching. Uh, this was just a quick little reaction video. Uh, let me know if you liked it. I could probably do more of these in the future. Uh, if you want to check out my description, there's going to be Patreon, social media, all that kind of stuff. Thanks a lot for watching. Uh, subscribe if you like. Hit bell. Blah, blah, blah. Thanks a lot. I'll see you all soon. Bye.